put our hair up in this style it's more like to keep it out of our way so we can you know work on things in summertime it helps to keep our head cool so I have never had long hair until 2000 it's when I started growing my hair my grandfather he always had his hair long my grandfather and grandmother used to always fix their hair together you know, my grandfather would sit down, my grandmother would fix his hair out there. So what we have here on display, this right here is our old traditional style of brush. This is what our ancestors used to use to brush our hair. You know, you see this in a lot of these old pictures. And what I'm also doing is paying attention to the symmetry of the basket. If you find that your diamonds here and your triangles are about the same size, then you're pretty well sure that your basket's going to be about the same size okay and then i'll do a hug hug the basket again one more time to make sure that they're up and then what i'll also do is go back out the other way because then it allows the willow to move into where it went okay and then so what i'm looking at on each of these strands is that they come up and that they're symmetrical you see from here i'm trying my best so i think for these i'd need to pull them a little bit further over to the left. By the time I was about 15, I was sitting under the plaza on my own, um, selling little pots year-round, teaching high school. You know, just really found the art itself just so beautiful um, and natural that I never had any other ideas of anything else I wanted to do. That was it for me. Um, my polishing was real iffy but I found that I could carve. So um, I think you push what you're good at. So in order to make my pieces look the way that I wanted them to look, I just carved the whole pot. I think, you know, one morning you wake up and you just start seeing things differently and you wanna make your own designs onto these pieces. Um, it's kind of in some ways crossing a line because is it then traditional? So for me, I thought, you know, if I'm going to be doing this the rest of my life, I'm going to do something that I enjoy and my interpretation. So why not use what is around me and my idea of traditional designs? So we're here at this micaceous jar made by Dominique Toya of Jemez Pueblo. This jar is a, you know, it's quite stunning in its um, execution. Um, composed of swirling ribs which swirl up to the top. Just quite a stunning piece and it became the uh, poster object for the show. Dominique is from Jemez Pueblo. In the past their pottery was um, often largely utilitarian with the rise of the potters at Jemez starting in the 70s and throughout the uh, 80s and 90s they've been able to kind of redefine what Jemez pottery is. Another avenue that I really like exploring is um, a little bit more of the sculptural aspect to um, different pottery shapes and these next series is kind of showing that sculptural aspect of my work. Um, I do also really like to play around with balance and trying to get something to balance in a way that it looks like it might fall over. However, they are super strong and sturdy and for the most part should stand for years unless a little kitty cat comes along and <laughs> knocks it over. When I started painting on um, currency um, in the 80s and Elaine Horowitz showed my work, it was really interesting because people thought I was this angry Indian. 
And they had a special, uh, 2020 had a special, came to Santa Fe on political Indian art. So it's me, David Bradley, Jane Ash Portress. I'm trying to think of some other natives in there. And everyone kind of fed into this lady's hand. She was doing this 2020 special on angry Indians. So I had one like this, but it was on the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. So she said, well, can you tell me about your political art? And I says, well, my art's not political, it's educational. So everyone else fed into her hands and told her what she wanted. And she goes, what do you mean? I see the Constitution, I see a battle scene, I see the Bill of Rights. I said, well, did you know tribes are not covered under the Bill of Rights or the American Constitution? We're, not, we're covered under the Indian Civil Rights Act? She goes, no, I didn't know that. I'm like, well, see there, it's educational. Cut, cut. She, <laughs> she didn't like it. She wanted, she wanted me to feed him like I was angry and, you know, I just read Bear in my heart at Wounded Knee yesterday. And, and that's what it is. Here we are at the opening wall for the exhibit. And the first thing that you see is a borrowed piece. This is a loan from Jeff Lewis. This is thought to be made, it's a fetish necklace made by Lichia Deus. This is a copy of a squash blossom that was made by a Santo Domingo artist and the owners loved it so much that they commissioned this piece which was made by a Zapotec Indian from Oaxaca and made out of gold and Persian turquoise. On the back row we have companion materials for turquoise. So in the Southwest, it's very often paired with shell of various kinds, including mother of pearl. It's often paired these days with coral, which is a European import. Probably took the place of argillite, which is a red stone that we find being used earlier. Coral's probably better because it has a watery origin. Jet and then spiny oyster which we see being used prehistorically as well. Let me point out several pieces here. Number two is a piece of, a single piece of shell that was mm -hmm. um, turned into a cuff by Angie Rieno Owen. It's red mountain turquoise. Note that she's got a little spondylus with the turquoise mosaic over it. Beautiful piece of turquoise. It's been identified as lander blue, whether it really is or not. I don't know. It was made by Tony Abeda. So to me, this looks like a starry night. You've got this dark spider web matrix with just these little bright spots of light in it. Right now, you can already see the finished piece on this that has a really nice glare to it, a really nice finish to it. We are going to do a final, final, final phase to this where it's going to be high shine with a leather wheel. And in this case, I have one that's already set just for stonework. And just like that last one we were doing, where it only has a pressure of two now to like one, so light. That's why I love using a Dremel because it's a foot control. You don't have to be using that at a really high, high speed. You're just taking that last little areas that you probably couldn't really hit too much on that wheel. This point right here, which will be the crown part, this, this corner section, um, is where the prong is actually going to come up on the turquoise and fit just like a 30 second or less above that crown so that when I push on the bezel it'll fit right on to the turquoise all the way around so that it gives it a perfect setting. Um, this is the piece that I kind of entered the Indian art market scene with. In 1999, I won Best of Show at Indian Market. I was uh, with this piece, this umbrella. It's a full-size umbrella. It's large. It's made out of hide, and it has a beaded pictorial that goes around it. And so eventually, uh, I entered it. Um, this was before I had children, so I could bead all night long and sleep during the day, which is my preferred time of working. And um, I entered it, and I was so green to Indian Market that when they said that I won best to show, I didn't know what that meant. So my mother said, you go stand up there and you shake everybody's hands because they're all making a big to-do over this. So I stood up there and I'm shaking hands and they, had, they used to have it all on one table, right? And so I'm standing up there behind it and I kept turning and looking, shaking hands and turning and looking at the ribbons and I realized that the only golden ribbon was on my piece. And that's when I realized I was up there probably 20, 30 minutes shaking hands before I realized I had won the award. 
Um, this is dancing to the heartbeat of my ancestors, and it's about carrying on that feeling of the, the culture of the spiritual beliefs, spiritual feeling, I should say. Even though it's a social dance, and and it's uh, more inner tribal, it's that feeling and dancing to the um, drum, which is the heartbeat of the people, and um, having that joy, that love, that good feeling, you know, having a good time, because a lot of times. To me, Native American women or Native Americans, period, are always um, portrayed as being stoic and serious and, you know, and, and that's not true. We love to laugh and we love to dance and we love to have fun. It, it's good, you know. So I wanted to bring that here. I mean, like she's, she's smiling and I want to give that feeling of, you know, how that is, that feeling of what that feels like. And I'm sure everybody feels it, too, you know, in certain experiences. This piece is called Child, and she is presenting her newborn uh, baby to the, the world, the universe. It's kind of um, a ceremony that happens in Pueblo societies of um, naming the child, and you name the child by presenting it to the, to the uh, dawn of the day, because it's kind of like um, the world is opening its eyes on that day, and when it first sees this new child, it will send some sign or some, yeah, some message that will tell you what the child's name is. So it's kind of an honoring of new life and um, uh, awa awakening, not just for this new life, but for the world to receive this life.